the deadly terror attack in the subway in St. Petersburg, Russia. And tonight we have new reporting on a second bomb discovered. The first device, full of metal shrapnel ripping through a subway car, passengers staggering out onto that platform. Russian officials now say that the blast is being investigated as a terror attack. Authorities defused a second bomb just two stops away that was four times as powerful as the one that blew up. Islamic extremists from the North Caucasus have attacked Russian public transport before. Their most recent subway attack was in 2010 when two suicide bombers killed at least 40 people in the Moscow metro. But since then, Russia has joined in Syria's messy civil war, and that may have put it squarely in the crosshairs of ISIS. According to Russian media, Scott, the police now think one man was responsible for this attack, a 23-year-old from Central Asia with links to radical Islamist groups. They believe that he hid the first bomb and then got on the train with the other one in a backpack and blew himself up. The cell phone videos of chaos and carnage today on a Russian subway platform are what law enforcement officials around the world fear could happen in their city thick acrid smoke, the mangled door of a subway car, passengers crying for help. At least 11 people were killed, their bodies pulled out of the wreckage. This bloodied woman was one of some 40 other passengers wounded in the blast, all from a single bomb that went off as the train traveled between two stations in mid-afternoon. Less than one hour later, officials discovered and disarmed a second bomb in this black bag, loaded with shrapnel, planted at another St. Petersburg subway station. It all happened in Russia's most westernized city, until now free from terror attacks, on the same day that Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in St. Petersburg as part of his re-election campaign. Well, uh, speaking of uh, the more impressive measures, the entire St. Petersburg metro system was shut down uh, after uh, the terrorist attack happened. And uh, just for you to understand, uh, there are two million passengers daily uh, using this metro system. It is the fourth busiest after Moscow, London, and Paris in Europe. And this really caused a uh, traffic uh, deadlock. Uh, buses were arranged that followed the uh, metro routes to really try and help uh, people get around the city uh, that was actually the time when most people were uh, leaving work. We were on the other side of the station from where the explosion happened, 10 minutes after. There were no medics yet. We saw smoke, fumes, people on the ground. I can't say how many, but several. I couldn't see clearly. The people lying on the ground were covered in black as if burnt. There was a crazy rush. The train I was in went slower for several seconds as stopping had been forbidden. We were able to see everything. Some people were crying at the horror of it all. The train car was mangled, the doors ripped out. As I was going down the escalator, I suddenly noticed a horrible stench of smoke. When the train arrived, I went in and started waiting for Technological Institute station to see what had happened, as I had heard from my friends about the evacuation there. People on the train didn't seem to know about the incident, as they waited to exit, but the door stayed closed. I looked out of the window and saw medical teams and firemen, and I also saw the heavily damaged train carriage. One girl, a complete stranger, grabbed my hand and asked to go out. It was really scary, heavy smoke everywhere. The explosion in St. Petersburg dominates Europe's main newspapers, with several of them using words such as terror or massacre on the metro. The story has special resonance in the UK in the wake of the recent attack in Westminster. In Lisbon and Brussels, the papers lament the number of victims while also discussing the challenge facing Russia in its fight against terrorism on several fronts. While in Germany, Chancellor Merkel is quoted within an article describing the attack as a barbaric act. But perhaps symbolism speaks louder than words. Outside Europe, a town hall in Rabin Square in Tel Aviv clothed itself in the colours of the Russian flag in a show of solidarity with St. Petersburg. October 2016 and Russian Federal Security Services storm a property in Nazran, capital of Ingushetia, in the northern Caucasus. During the raid, six suspected militants were killed, one an alleged ISIL member who had fought in Syria. Russian authorities claim he was planning attacks in Russia. 
Moscow is monitoring Russian speakers who've joined ISIL in recent times. Most arrived in 2013. Authorities estimate that 3,000 fighters were in Syria by the end of 2015. Some mention as many as 5,000. Most of the Russian speakers fighting in Syria originate from the Caucasus. The region is a hotbed of instability since the Chechen wars. Abu Omar al-Shishani is known as the Chechen. Foreign fighters are also known as Chechens by ISIL. Al-Shishani is a child veteran of the two Chechen wars. He's held in high regard. In 2013, he pledged allegiance to ISIL and became a commander in Syria. He was killed last year. Moscow is in a quandary. Have these Chechens truly embraced ISIL ideology or are they arming, preparing and training for the day they return? Russia could invade in 24 hours. The stark warning from Baltic state Lithuania. The country's intelligence agencies claim the Kremlin has upgraded its regional military capabilities. Their assessment, Moscow can now launch an attack on any Baltic state in just a day. The speed could limit NATO's ability to respond. Lithuania points to a Russian military build-up in Kaliningrad as being behind the increased threat. The Russian upgrade allegedly including Su-30 fighter aircraft and missile systems allowing ships to be targeted almost anywhere in the Baltic Sea. The Kremlin has dismissed the concerns as anti-Russian sentiment. Recently it's protested against increased NATO troop deployments to the region. But NATO's Baltic members have become increasingly nervous since the Russian takeover of Crimea in 2014. Just last month Moscow showcased some of its hardware in exercises on the annexed territory. The sum of all fears for Russia's neighbours, they could be overrun by tomorrow. A high-level North Korean defector has warned that the regime will use nuclear weapons once it sees any kind of imminent threat from the United States. Taeyong Ho, a former North Korean diplomat to London who defected to Seoul last year, told NBC that the world needs to be prepared to deal with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, saying Kim relies on his regime's nuclear and ballistic missile arsenal to maintain a grip on power Tay suggested the ultimate solution to the North Korean nuclear issue is to remove Kim from power. With the stakes on the Korean peninsula as high as they ever have been, life for the men and women with the U.S. Air Force's 51st Fighter Wing is lived in a state of constant alert. South Korea has no nuclear weapons, so it relies on the United States nuclear umbrella to deter North Korea and its erratic leader Kim Jong-un. Osan in South Korea is less than 50 miles from the demilitarized zone that separates the mortal enemies and is home to a large portion of nearly 30,000 U.S. military personnel in South Korea, making it the leading edge of the shield that protects the South from the North. Un is desperate and is prepared to use nuclear weapons to strike the United States and its allies, which means that at any moment the men and women of Osan could have to drop everything, grab their gear, and go into battle. While troops of India and Pakistan have exchanged heavy fire and targeted each other's positions on the line of control, dividing the disputed region of Kashmir. Indian defense officials said the exchange started on Monday morning. No casualties or damage were reported on the Indian side. An Indian army officer was killed in a blast in this area early on Saturday. Now both countries accuse each other of provocations and violations of ceasefire agreements. Frayed by years of political upheaval in Cairo, the U.S.-Egypt relationship is now officially in repair mode. Donald Trump is emphasizing mutual security interests during talks with President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. We agree on so many things. I just want to let everybody know, in case there was any doubt, that we are very much behind President al-Sisi. He's done a fantastic job in a very difficult situation. Sisi has taken a hard line against all Islamists. His regime outlawed the Brotherhood and has targeted violent ISIS offshoots in the Sinai Peninsula. For two years, former U.S. President Barack Obama distanced himself from al-Sisi, suspending the 1.3 billion U.S. dollar military aid budget to Egypt. It's the first visit by an Egyptian leader to the White House in eight years. 
Your Excellency, since we met last September, I've had a deep appreciation and admiration of your unique personality, especially as you are standing very strong in the counterterrorism field. To counter this evil ideology that is claiming innocent lives, that is bringing devastation to communities and nations, and that is terrorizing the innocent people. Al Sisi is looking for closer business and investment ties and continued U.S. military and civilian aid at a time of economic turbulence in Egypt, where inflation has hit over 30 percent, following a painful currency devaluation. And U.S. President Trump is hoping this pragmatic friendship will yield closer cooperation on military and intelligence as it relates to countering ISIL and other militant groups in North Africa and the Middle East. <laughs> President's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner is adding another item to his already broad White House portfolio, making an unannounced trip to Baghdad to show support for Iraq's, for Iraq's government as it fights ISIS forces in Mosul. Kushner is traveling with Joseph Dunford, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Margaret Brennan has more on Kushner's ever-expanding White House role. 36-year-old Jared Kushner has no diplomatic experience, but he's become an envoy to foreign leaders, at times in place of the Secretary of State. If you can't produce peace in the Middle East, nobody can. Before taking office, the president tasked his son-in-law with brokering peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. Kushner played a key role in February's visit from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Can I reveal, Jared, how long we've known you? <laughs> Finessing the strained relationships with Mexico and working with the Canadian government are also Kushner projects. Perhaps Kushner's biggest task will come later this week. He has led preparations for a high-stakes visit from the Chinese president. During the Washington Nationals season opening game Monday in Washington, D.C., protesters brought a banner that said, Impeach Trump, hashtag resist, revealing it just as the game was ending. The organizers behind the stunt were reportedly from the group Americans Take Action, who also pulled a prank at the Conservative Political Action Conference by distributing small Russian flags with Trump's name. According to one of the group's members, Jason Charter, Americans Take Action was planning on revealing the banner when Trump was on the field to throw the ceremonial first pitch. However, the White House said last week that Trump would not attend the game. Guys, this is pretty interesting and worth noting. Two South Carolina lawmakers prepping survivalist communities to restore the fabric of America. So you got two guys from tiny towns in the Bible Belt, from what they say here in upstate South Carolina, that are in the process of setting up what they call the Virtue Solution Project, a group that is seeking to either save America or survive a societal collapse, which they both believe is likely coming. The organization is a mixture of religious ministry, grassroots political organizing, and disaster prepping. At its core, their movement hopes to save the country by reshaping it to their interpretation of the Founding Fathers' ideals. Well, I like what I'm hearing so far, guys. They're advocating that their followers and offshoot groups form their own communities that will no longer have to rely on corporate America or the tyrannical federal government. They're encouraging neighbors to support principled men such as themselves who are willing to nullify laws and court rulings they don't agree with, like abortion, gay marriage, gun restrictions, and federal standards for driver's licenses. California is a pretty crazy state. I love so many things about it, and so many things about it drive me crazy. This story is about one of the crazier things they've done lately, because they just tried to introduce a bill to combat the evil of fake news. This is what legislators in California are doing with their time. They introduced AB 1104, a bill that is all about censorship, really, in a crazy way. 
The bill they wanted to turn into law actually read, it is unlawful for a person to knowingly and willingly make, publish, or circulate on an internet website or cause to be made, published, or circulated in any writing posted on an internet website a false or deceptive statement designed to influence the vote on either of the following, any issue submitted to voters at an election and any candidate for election to public office. In other words, California legislators wanted to make it illegal to be wrong on the internet, or even just deceptive, a term with a lot of wiggle room for interpretation and opinion. Let that sink in. California wanted to make it illegal to post stuff on the internet that someone else would deem inaccurate about politicians. They didn't specify who would be deeming the information as wrong either. How insane is that? That is some serious Orwellian level of crazy right there. Facebook Mozilla and Craigslist founder Craig Newmark are part of a consortium of tech leaders, academics, and nonprofits committing $14 million into the creation of the News Integrity Initiative. The consortium was jointly announced on Monday. The SUNY Graduate School of Journalism will administer the initiative. The school will spearhead new literacy and aim to increase trust in journalism around the world. During last year's U.S. presidential election, the issue of fake news was highlighted as being a significant problem. Facebook's platform in particular was called out for allowing people to easily spread false news stories. The Mexican newspaper has printed its final edition after one of its journalists was shot and killed outside her home. The front page of El Norte de Ciudad Juarez read adios on Sunday, April 2nd. According to a translation by the Associated Press, owner Oscar Cantu Murguia wrote that he's closing up shop because, quote, among other things, there are neither the guarantees nor the security to exercise critical counterbalance journalism. Chihuahua City correspondent Miroslava Breach Vildusea was reportedly shot eight times while sitting in her car on March 23rd. A child in the vehicle was unharmed. Meanwhile, a note left by Breach Veldusea's body read, quote, for being a loudmouth. Her beat was crime and corruption. The Committee to Protect Journalists says dozens of journalists have been killed in Mexico since 1992. Sunday marked the last print edition of El Norte. The online edition will soon follow. According to Allure.com, acne specialist Joshua Zeichner says the incidence of adult female acne is increasing every year. Seichner is the Director of Cosmetic and Clinical Research in Dermatology at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and reportedly there are plans in the works for creating an acne vaccine. In the April issue of Allure magazine, it's been reported that nearly 50 million Americans are diagnosed with acne every year, estimated to be more than the entire population of Australia and Canada. This pill is called Mucojet, and researchers have proven that it can deliver vaccine-type drugs that would normally need to be administered with an injection. The capsule is inserted into the mouth against the cheek, where it releases a jet stream of drugs, using the same basic principles of an elementary school volcano science project. Mix different substances together to produce a chemical reaction that creates pressure and erupts. When the pressure builds up high enough and it breaks the membrane on the nozzle, then we get this jet. Your drug is now being ejected out of the cap, out of the pill at a super high velocity, and it's coming out at a velocity that's high enough to gently permeabilize the epithelial cells and also go through the mucus. And so it's this very mild permeabilization that we're doing that essentially gets the protein across these one or two barriers that it needs to. The research is still in its early stages. Mucojet was able to deliver vaccine-type drugs effectively in rabbits, but more research is needed to see if the tech is as effective in larger mammals and eventually humans. But if it worked, it could completely change the way vaccines and some other drugs are delivered. It would be great to be able to have better distribu distribution of vaccines, so you don't need nurses, especially when you're in rural areas. Also for parents who are worried about getting too many vaccines at one time, this would allow you to actually space out vaccines. 
because you can do it at home. You don't have to do it at the doctor. The technology can prove a game changer during a health crisis when large groups of people need to be treated quickly. The scientists are also working on a version of Mucojet that is swallowed and programmed to release drugs in the intestinal tract. This, they say, could one day lead to drugs like insulin being administered without an injection as well. Botswana has been rocked by what appears to be its strongest ever earthquake, just hours after South Africa was also struck. This afternoon's earthquake has measured 6.8 on the Richter scale, a rare strong quake for Africa. Luckily the quake's epicenter struck an area with few inhabitants. Users took to the earthquake report website to express their shock and describe their experience. One writing from the city of Letlhakain, said, We felt the house was vibrating, all the window and door panels shaking heavily. We went outside and felt the same. Quakes of this size are air in Botswana, with geological experts saying it could be historically large. Last quake said, Earthquakes in Hash Botswana are pretty rare. Nothing comparable in our catalogue over the last decades. Well, it's going to be another rough night in the south. Severe storms, including tornadoes that killed at least four people in the past two days, are now moving east, tearing a path of destruction from the Florida panhandle to the Carolinas. There it is, tornado. Over the last 36 hours, 29 tornadoes have been reported across the deep south, killing a mother and daughter in a mobile home in south Louisiana. Nine inches of rain sparked flash flooding in Alexandria, Louisiana, nearly shattering a 70-year record. In Luverne, Alabama this afternoon, families consoled one another after extreme weather uprooted trees and leveled homes. In Florence, Mississippi, 52-year-old Jacqueline Williams was trapped in her car after it slid into a creek. We got a female stranded. She can't get out of her vehicle. She cannot swim. She's drowning and she's gargling. She could hear sirens, police say, and was trying to guide a 911 dispatcher to her location when she drowned. The words don't describe. Florence Police Chief Richard Thomas. They're, they're real good people. Kids are good people. Uh, I hate that it happened. Most of the deaths from these storms in the south happened in mobile homes, and I want to show you why experts say it is the last place you want to be in a tornado. Here in Luverne, Alabama, this patch of dirt is where a mobile home stood for three years until this morning. And eyewitnesses say a tornado flipped it and rolled it probably 80 feet. Scott, there was a mother and her two young kids who were inside. They crawled out with no injuries. We are also on the scene of a disaster in South America. You're about to see the grim aftermath of devastating flooding and mudslides. And take a look at this tonight. This is the list of the dead and the missing. So many of them children. High above the disaster zone, you can see all of the damage, but down on the ground, you can feel the pain. This is where the dead, more than 260, are waiting to be identified. As you enter Makoa, this is one of the grim signs you first see. This is outside the cemetery. You can see them bringing in one of the bodies. And then these are our people who lived in Makoa. They're trying to identify some of the bodies that are here. These catastrophic images still fresh in the minds of those who survived. A wall of water, mud and debris crashed into the town in the middle of the night. So powerful, it pushed cars on top of trees. And more than 60 children dying when this avalanche of death came rolling in. We met Octavio Cardone inside the town's hospital. Every inch of his body scratched, bruised or broken, but his story is even more painful. He tells me how he lost his grip on his nine-year-old daughter when the wall of water hit. She and his wife among the hundreds still missing. His six-year-old son dying in the disaster. And David, that father we met in the hospital who likely lost his entire family is now begging that the city set up some type of warning system so this never happens again. The sun didn't get the memo about April Fool's Day because the eruptions it hurled into space starting April 1st were no joke. The flares were followed soon after by a pair of small asteroids making close passes by Earth, all adding up to some lively space weather you probably didn't even notice. Two medium-sized solar flares were thrown off the same sunspot, one on Saturday and an even bigger one on Sunday. A number of coronal mass ejections, much larger, slower-moving and shorter explosions of a hot material called plasma were also thrown off. 
In addition to these explosions, we also had two asteroids buzz by, one closer than the moon and the other just a little further away. It's hard to see here, but a little girl's actions went far beyond her size. Barely able to fit in the chair, three-year-old Lillian decided to join a police officer for dinner. The adorable moment was captured on the restaurant surveillance camera. Sergeant Stephen Deere says Lillian sat down with him while he was waiting for his food at a Panera Bread. Her parents watched from a table nearby as the two chatted and took this photo when they were finished. The interaction may not have been long, but the moment was sweet enough to last a lifetime.